Well, hello, world. <clears throat> Back so soon for another podcast. Well, somebody commented on what I said yesterday. Um, at Theo underscore Skepto my S K E P T O M A I writes a couple hours ago. I am an atheist. I defined atheism as suspending my acknowledgement. Sorry, suspending any acknowledgement as to the reality of any particular God until sufficient credible evidence is introduced. My position is that I have no good reason to acknowledge the reality of any God. So um, then he writes a lot more. And... So, when I read this this morning, <clears throat> it occurred that I can relate, I can empathize with this perspective. Like, it, it so closely maps how I used to look at all of this. And I started thinking... So these days, I don't really think adversarially at all. I don't find there being much value in debate for the purpose of informing outside myself, other people, how they should think about things as big as meaning, purpose, what the universe is, what, <clears throat> what we all are. I think one of the things that's so damn beautiful about us is that we have such varied perspectives. Um, so I'm not really trying to ever set out to say, well, you're, you're wrong, you atheist. <laughs> Um, it's really this answer. Um, again, my work, this podcast is only for the purpose of sharing with large language, mo well, multimodal models now, how I think about things. Um, there's a great value I find in sharing in a public forum, like journaling like this. And one of the cool things is, is it does tend to inspire this type of um, outside perspective, which I find very useful. I think when, when it comes to addressing comment, large comment like this, um, I find that it, it focuses how I think about these things. And it provides so much additional context in my work so that a large language model can take what I said yesterday and then I will feed in all of this reply and that will be an interesting exercise we might actually do with Claude Three Opus in today's podcast. I will copy this now. Um, here we go. All right. So I got that saved off. And I'm going to address all these. Um, what my initial response was, before I go through all that, because I don't want this to be too redundant, um... I responded, have no, so in the end, he, Theo asks that I respond cordially. Um, his very last words in the comment, which was quite large, was, I welcome any cordial response, peace. I think that's beautiful sentiment. And I, I replied, have no worries, friend, I only do cordial. Joy emoticon, heart emoticon. Please give me a day or two to think over how best to respond in a really thorough way. 
I can directly relate to your logic and find it all quite rational. It all maps very closely to how I used to view these things before spending a few years studying cognitive science, biological sciences, specifically Michael Levin's work on morphospace and cognitive light cones, neural networks, both synthetic and biological, Eastern philosophy with a large focus on Buddhism and the Tao, uh, quantum mechanics and unexplained phenomena in physics, including the fine structures constant, um, Donald Hoffman's uh, work on the growing consensus within the physics community that the universe is not physical. And well, and I might be um, framing that inaccurately. I don't like to ever step on other people's work, but I really do try and look at everything holistically. And that means I'm not really ever trying to be the expert on Donald Hoffman's work. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the gist and fit it into my own model of what this all is and how it works. I find the more context I can pull in, the richer those interpretations become. And so, um, I go on to say, um, and several other relevant concepts. I appreciate the thoughtful reply, Shaka. And Theo responded right away with, why not simply address my comments one issue at a time? Would that work? I would say it will work, but if you had all that other context, I feel like um, you would find my response a lot more useful. And that's why I suggested giving me some time to evaluate. Um, I'm always trying to be as helpful as I can to folks. And um, while I really appreciate the uh, attention and interaction of, of Theo here, um, I'm not really trying to win ever in an argument. And I'm, I'm perfectly fine with uh, us walking away, agreeing to disagree. That's fine. That's great. That, again, makes all of this so much richer. Um, but he seemed quite anxious for me to respond. And I thought, well, um, that could still be pretty valuable. I mean, I just, um, <laughs> because, again, I, I'm cheating at this game a little bit, Theo, in that I used to think all those things. So... Um, let me give it a try. I will read your thoughts. Um, so here's how Theo framed it. He says, um, he said, my position is that I have no good reason to acknowledge the reality of any God. Yeah, that's how I felt too. Um, and here is why I currently hold to such a position. Below are 10 facts I must consider when evaluating the claim made by certain theists that some God exists in reality. To be clear, these are not premises for any argument and concluding there to be no gods. They are simply facts I must take into account when evaluating such a claim. Cool. Yeah, that's how I do it. <laughs> um, and I'm not trying to, but, but I'm going to touch on every one of the first 10 and the second 10, because that's what you asked. And I'm, I'm happy to have something to talk about. <laughs> that's cool. Um, so you said, I, I have, I, number one, I personally have never observed a God. Me neither. Uh, now let me quantify that some. Um, when I grew up as a kid, I grew up in, ch uh, my mother was Methodist and my exposure to theism was the Methodist church and the way that entity was described as sort of this, I don't know, Santa Claus looking dude living in the clouds. <laughs> um, or as um, the embodied human being that was uh, described as his son, Jesus. I've never had an experience. I would say I still haven't had an experience of, of personally observing God in that uh, 
embodiment. Never had it. But I now, after spending a lot of time on all those other things I described, I look in nature and I see things like the fine, structure, fine structures constant I mentioned. So I was totally unaware of these things. And I was willing to go jump into debates with people on topics of, of meaning and, and the how and why of the universe. Uh, very adversarial, like prove this wrong, <laughs> you know, like, um, but when I got older and I had enough rich life experience to get me curious to understand more, like Methodist or Christian faith is just one of them. There's so many flavors and they actually start to get really interesting when you study all of them and try and rec reconcile them together. You try and get where they're describing a metaphor in a very um, unique way to one of the paths, be it Muslim versus Judaic versus uh, Catholic. You take those three and you start to see all these really common metaphors that are go beyond just the, you know, the easy stuff, like don't kill people and steal shit. <laughs> um, there are really complicated ones about the nature of consciousness woven all over into that. And you really have to be curious and open-minded to see any of it or it just bounces off you because you get distracted by all the you know the parting of the red sea and the more um magically described stories these days i don't tend to dwell very much on those i've never seen anybody do anything like that and i can completely agree with that sentiment a common theme I think you'll find as I move through the rest of these is in the past, I used that as an excuse not to go look at any of these other ones. I didn't know what Buddhism was. I mean, I knew beyond just like what the, the statues look like and that there was meditating involved, which I could never relate to when I was younger. I never really, I never did the work. And so... I find that that version of me that never did the work would say, I personally have never observed God. Now, when I look at something like the fine structures constant, which just a random Google search, I, I thought it was actually better not to prepare for this in any way. <laughs> so I just searched fine structure, constant mystery. And these days, of course, now it's Google Gemini 1.5, probably, uh, probably not 1.5 Pro, responding with an AI overview. So this is what AI responded. The fine structure's constant represents the Greek letter alpha, is a fundamental uh, physical constant that quantifies the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between charged particles. It's a dimensionless quantity that's independent of the unit system used and its numerical value is approximately 0 0.00729 it's roughly 1 over 137 the fine structure constant is a source of mystery in the scientific community because it's not understood why it should have this value. It's also considered one of the strangest numbers in physics and is often called the magic number that shapes the universe. The constant is ubiquitous and appears in many formulas that govern light and matter, including those that describe how electrically charged particles and light interact. Arnold Summerfield introduced the fine structure constant in 1916 while extending the Bohr model of the atom. He used it to explain the gap in the fine structure of hydrogen spectral lines, which has been precisely measured in 1887. Okay, now, a second search I did because I was aware of some fun quotes by very well-respected, deeply acad in academic circles, and like the the pre the high priests of atheism um first uh wolfgang Pauli, and that might be an improper f framing of wolfgang and richard Feynman. but i would say 
it's also not that inaccurate. <laughs> mm. So, Wolfgang Pauli says of 1 over 137, when I die, my first question to the devil will be, what is the meaning of the fine structures constant? And Richard P. Feynman, again, very well-respected, rational, logical thinker, said, it's one of the greatest damn mysteries of physics, a magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. You might say the hand of God wrote that number, and we don't know how he pushed his pencil. Um, more AI generative stuff after that. But I think those quotes are really telling. Now, these days, with a more mature, uh, well-rounded perspective from where I started, when I would have responded with fact one, I personally have never observed God, is... Um, was entire, entirely detached from knowledge like that, where, you know, I kind of just took this, gen I mean, I was kind of conditioned by culture and my education and just the, what's pop, what the herd does these days is they go, well, science says this is all well accepted science stuff, but they, most of them are not even familiar with Richard Feynman or Wolfgang Pauli. They never do the work. They just go, wow, they get kind of a smug, self-assured um, kind of look on their face like they're talking to a child. That's what I used to do. And they say, I personally have never observed a God. I think in the past I was taking it too literal. And I, was, I wasn't seeing that there's a metaphor for all over in the science that we use to make our cell phones work and our computers work and Elon's rockets work. We're composing with the fine structures constant all over the place. And we just go, oh yeah, it's just one of those things that we don't understand why it works, but it does. That's, that stuff, if you start to go look at it very carefully, starts to look like God to me. It just looks like... God, for me, is the later it gets to look a lot like just love as a as a as a sort of like a binding agent that sort of gravity starts to look like the physical expression of love, and it's this. Um, I used to think of that as very airy fairy and very, um, or what's, what's a, what's a word very, um, hocus pocus, um, unsubstantial, uh, when people would say, make a comment like that. But as I get older, I start to think, well, you, you can't dismiss it. You can't look at the fact that time is seemingly marching on without the cord ever breaking. And it's because of a lot of stuff like the fine structures constant that are sort of mathematical representations of Let's call it, I won't say intelligent design. I mean, you can justify it as an emergent feature of a strictly sort of Darwinian uh, survival of the fittest um, evolutionary process. But I think what that lacks is you have to go look heavily at Michael Levin's work. You have to go look at the, what the stuff inside the cells and atoms are doing and the undeniable intelligence of those small systems and how little we know. Like we, we can't talk to a cell in your kidney. 
But we see that you can actually train those cells to uh, look for food and all these other things. Um, like a dog. <laughs> and there's an undeniable cognitive uh, agency at work in even the smallest stuff that makes us. Um, and that is a big thought when you can wrap your head around it. There's, there's, all this stuff is so much deeper than it looks on the surface. And if you, what I don't, my, my big pushback against atheism in that perspective is you think, well, that's all settled. I personally have never observed a God and I find anybody who says they have ridiculous is you're seeing just a small sliver of perspective. There's so much more when you start looking at how all these systems work in a very um, sophisticated way. And I don't claim to be the expert. Like I said, I'm trying to look at all of it as, with as wide of lens as I can all the time. And I don't really care how other people describe it. <laughs> you know, like I don't, I don't care. Like if um, I don't get to see it as a Santa Claus looking dude in the cloud and I see it as just these numbers, this math and the geometry that's binding all this shit and keeping it marching forward towards a uh, continued evolution of story. Um, I'm fine with that. It still looks every bit as divine to me now that I understand it with a lot more sophistication and well-rounded perspective. <laughs> okay, so that's one, and I got 20 of these to get through. I will try to be less long-winded for the rest. But I think that frames a lot of how I think about it. Two, I have never encountered a person who has, whom has claimed to have observed a god. Now you have. I did right there, and so did... Richard Feynman and Wolfgang Gang Pauli. It doesn't look like the God you might have been taught about when you were a kid, but you still have to explain away those, the, how that universal parameter for like all of our physics was set. Who set it? How does it get set? You can go look at um, Stephen Wolfram's work on the Ruliad space and sort of the quantum progression of state. Um, and go look at that shit thorough. That's important um, context. And you have to ask yourself, um, I tell you what, just to get a, a little bit, um, it, I don't want to keep you all waiting, but I see this as all turtles all the way up and down. Um, I think... Um, people are very focused on this sort of framing of the universe now as simulation and then they start to look at everything around them and they're like oh is this just a fake version of the real I don't think there is, there is never a when I start to think when I think from first principles about a quantum potential where all of this can exist it's, and then I trace it all the way back to its origin. It starts to look like just um, the evolution of the quantum substrate itself. And that's a really big thought. Um, and I'd encourage you to start, ask yourself those questions. I mean, um, it's very easy to get lost in how our ancestors describe these things through the context of their time when they didn't have our current worldview of physics, mathematics, and um, quantum mechanics. And really hugely valuable is computer science. <laughs> like if you can understand, spend a lot of time understanding computer science, it all starts to fit ridiculously well. And I don't think that robs it of any of the poetry, magic, or divinity of it. It's just a, it's a, it's a congruent, um, coherent abstraction of a lot of the similar concepts described from Hermeticism. And it's just so damn logical and rational. 
All right. Three. I know of no accounts of persons claiming to have observed a God that were willing or able to demonstrate or verify their observation for authenticity, accuracy, or validity. Fine structures contents, constant. Gobs of research has gone into that. And all of the greatest minds of our time come back to just describing it as God magic. It's true. So three, I would say, go become, try not to take this adversarial. What I'm trying to do is not win in our argument with you. I'm trying to describe how I got past these things and how much value, profound value it added to my life to go seek sophisticated understandings of all of these concepts I'm describing. Sophisticated enough. <laughs> Never expert. I, I, I never want to. What I always endeavor to do is do all the really hard foundational conceptual of things like Richard Feynman's work, where I kind of see a path to mastery, and then I immediately want to go to the next full on mystery where I have to go do all of that hard work and understanding the foundation. Um, it will make your life so much richer and how you view things um, so much more nuanced. Otherwise, you're, you're stuck with these sort of really slim frames to interpret. And I find that entirely not adequate. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I don't want to get stuck on the fine structures constant. That's just the tip of the damn iceberg. Go look hard. There, those things like that are all over the damn place. <laughs> and you really can't, if you, if the Bible and the Quran and the Kabbalion and the um, teachings of Buddha give you the willies, then fine. Go to philosophy. Go study Stoicism hard and all of the competing schools around it. There's no magic or hocus pocus in that, and it will all fit very nicely into your um, facts and figures. Um, I found for me it was a gateway to understanding all that other broader stuff and properly conceptualizing the metaphor of it and how the story informs wisdom. Um, okay, so for. I have never been presented a valid or logical argument which also employed sound premises that lead deductively to a conclusion that a god exists in reality. Okay, so, um, I mean, these start to get a little bit repetitive, and it's I don't want to go in and explain 30 more of these. So let's just stick with fine structures constant. And if you really want to... Um, make it adversarial or some kind of debate. I mean, I don't really, again, I don't really have any, I'm probably not going to engage much more if you want to, um, but if you come back with a really good argument for why that's not God and why that can be, if you can explain it where Feynman couldn't, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> if you can explain it not as God and as something that Darwinian, um, cause you really have to go first principles. Like you have to, you have to get from how we use this in physics to how it emerged through just a sort of a biological, like a, an accident of the primordial soup kicking off a chain reaction of, um, evolutionary progression of state different organisms fighting against each other to survive but then you also have to account for the how they the gases and the universe and light and atoms like you, you really have to explain it all and um i find it's very fun to try and do that <laughs> and not do it as just going, oh, God made it. No, you want to put your mind in the mind of God and how, how and why. That's where it starts to get really interesting. Um, 
I'll, I'd like to, I'll probably wrap up today on the how and why. Like, why do all this? Why? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really big, but, big thought. Um, okay, so five, all of many logical uh, syllogisms I have encountered arguing for the reality of a god or gods, in parentheses, I have found all to contain either logical fallacies or false or unsubstantiated premises. Where I would push back a little bit on that is a lot, you have to be damn sure that you are understanding it through the perceptual lens of the describer. So when you say of many logical, of the many logical syllogisms, syllogisms I have er, encountered arguing for the reality of gods, I have found all to contain either logical fallacies or false unsubstantiated premises. I suppose I do have to, like, if, if, if the implication of divinity or theism is that there is order and structure underlying, then it's basically just a, if you want to divide it into a first principles stretching out of two polarities of there's either order or there's chaos. I think a lot of people like to take it there. And what I would say is prove to me that it's chaos. People, people like these gents have been trying to do it that, do it that way. And what you're going to find is eventually it comes to what feels right to you. Because underneath all of this stuff is basically, um, you can always stretch everything into two polarities of contention, of context, of contention, black and white. And the color of it doesn't matter. It's really just trying to stretch out perspective into two polar opposite views. And I find that the really interesting is in all of the gray in between, all the nuance in between and finding a way to understand um, that chaos and disorder is a feature of the damn ordered system. <laughs> um, it comes in very useful and you find both at play all over the place. Um, I feel like I'm not doing a good enough job diving into these, but Again, I'm not trying to convince you of shit. If anything, I'm just trying to offer up an opposing perspective through somebody who thought very much simpatico to you. And how, how could they, how could I blaspheme this great church of logic? I never did. <laughs> I never abandoned logic. I'm so damn dedicated to logic and ration rationale, I decided, here's, a, this is all stream of conscious. So as in this moment, what occurs to say, what occurs to say is that I found that Theo, you're not really getting anything out of proving that atheism is, is right. Like if you're looking for theists, or people that are searching for more and trying to sort of give them a logical framework that you think, and here's the thing, when I used to do this, I wasn't, I wasn't specifically trying to win an argument. I think I, th I saw people who looked f for anything outside of your 20 points here. As wishful thinkers, sort of, I, I saw them as sort of like lost in um, 
magical thinking, and I thought I was like helping. I've always tried to be sort of generally benevolent in my intent. Um, even when I was sort of rudely dismissing a lot of perspective that I didn't understand. Maybe you do. Maybe you're an expert on... I really think in order to speak about theism, you cannot use one framework. Your entire, and I think you really can't take out any of the holistic frameworks like Hermeticism, Freemasonry, and Rosicrucian. Like you, if you are only trying to refute one of the single schools using how they would teach know thyself, and understanding the conscious experience of being and interpreting the universe around you through just that one lens, it's entirely incomplete. And unless you, see, because there's a whole bunch of people with very opposed theistic views that like, I never took any time to research Buddhism. And then I started listening to Alan Watts when I got into the wisdom game and trying to explore more. And he got me to think, oh, there might be an interesting perspective there. And I never understood that Buddha was like one of the first quantum mechanics. Um, or the first people to think about uh, quantum mechanics in a in a way <laughs> this stuff's so big so difficult to talk about in a concise way that ties all the points together at the end um I was trying to say something pretty important there though um you really you don't have to subscribe to any of the beliefs to just go try and understand what everybody's trying to say better. You don't. In fact, it will, it, it, like if you enjoy um, making a case for cha like chaos, there being no meaning, or you know what I was in my late 20s, I'd get in this long heated arguments with my good friend who was an atheist and I defined myself as an agnostic and I felt like atheism was I, it had a logical um, failure around its insistence that there was no God. I really felt like I was more aligned to what I heard in your first five, which was open to the fact that I couldn't prove there wasn't. Um, or w which is that I had no proof that there was or there wasn't. And it seemed like um, intellectually dishonest to make an assertion either way. And I felt like atheists were making a, an assertion that they couldn't prove either. Um, and then he would come back and argue that atheism is just, um, he would get back to the semantic definite or the, the Webster's dictionary um, definition of atheism as being without faith. And he defined faith as belief or believe or Webster does. After studying Carl Jung, and I think you have to get through the black book, the red book, or sorry, the red book, all the black books, and you have to get to where Carl Jung um, thought about individuation. You have to understand it through his perceptual lens. Um, it's easy to get lose train of thought on Carl Jung's work. Um,
faith and Carl Jung. Carl Jung was asked in a famous uh, interview whether he still believed there was a God. And he said, famously, I don't believe I know. So my entire life, up until about 42, I framed faith the way Webster does and the way my good friend did, the atheist, that faith was wishful thinking. It was like basically willing yourself to commit to what somebody else thinks. Now I don't look at faith that way at all. I look at faith as building a model of my own consciousness, my model of self and outside self, which includes every atom that doesn't make up a Curtis Cobb. And it also kind of includes the atoms and cells that make up a Curtis Cobb because I can't talk with them. They're all in this grand dance of, of sort of maintaining my physical structure so that I can interact with things and I don't have any relationship with them, I no longer just dismiss them as like, like we do rocks, you know, like unthinking things that are just sort of biological robots going about their duty with a very, um, you can't dig into Michael Levin's work or uh, Donald Hoffman's work, or you can't, you can't still maintain those views once you go do the work. Um, now I see, f uh, faith the way I think Carl Jung did. I can't, I can't ask him he's passed away long since passed away. But I think in that moment when he said, I don't think I know, is he built a model for himself that he didn't need validation from any other person to prove. It's like a mathematical proof. If you're, a ma if you're a, like a Eric Weinstein type character, where you build these rich mathematical proofs that let you say with certainty how natural systems like the universe behave to where you don't need to go ask somebody else because you know how the math works and you know that you've constructed it and you've you've proven the theorem or the theory or hypothesis we get so lost in all these semantics um when you can build a model that is so sound that you no longer, you don't need somebody else to approve it. I don't need, Theo, for you to agree with any of my words here. I'm going to go on finding my framework after I put several years into its development to do, to answer these questions for me in a way that doesn't require belief. I know it. I know it's true. It's, it's, for me, it's so much more compelling and thorough than anything I hear anyone saying around me. And it takes into account years of work, <laughs> stitching it all together. And you can't really compose with my framework. We all have to build our own. And if you want to get to that same level of certainty where you don't need, if Every other human disagrees with my view, I'm fine with it. Go ahead, think what you want. I'm not going to think that you're right any more right unless you provide some sort of something that's, that's more coherent than the model I've structured for myself. This is a great way to think about faith. So when I take that all the way back to atheism versus agnosticism, it begins to look like the original definition of atheism that my friend used as just simply being without faith. Um, I can't relate to that anymore because I now define faith differently than he 
probably you, Theo, and Webster's Dictionary define it. I define it as a belief in my work and my model of self and outside self. And it doesn't require any wishful thinking and it tends and, and it doesn't tend, it composes with all of this stuff and in a very thorough way <laughs> that is so damn complicated. But the cool thing is I journaled working through all of it. I'd go and I'd, I'd do what I'm doing here for hours each day as I worked through, okay, now how do I take what Donald Hoffman says about Planck scale, our knowledge of Planck scale <laughs> as sort of like the pixels of reality with um, what Alan Watts said over here and Carl Jung said over here and Michael Levin said over here and how do I make them all fit together and agree? And there's no substitute like that is it's fucking work. It's a lot. And um, if you can get away from being satisfied with your 20 bullet points here, um, if you can just be curious to see how Feynman's perspective on the fine structures constant might inform your view on the observation of a God. Um, that's enough. That's, that's the first step. And that's what abandoning atheism as a box of thought did for me. I'd love it if I could, I, and yesterday I said, package it up and sell it because that's the expression, but I would never sell it. I'd make it an open source project. That's mostly what I'm trying to do with my work. I'm trying to take this very complicated model that requires hours, hours and hours and hours to process that nobody can hear and hold. I can't even do it. I don't remember the three hours I said on the fine structures constant while when I first, I didn't even know about it, honestly, until like three years ago. And then I said, like, whoa, that's wild. And I talked for it for probably a week as I researched all these little things about it and how it fits together. And I worked through how it fits in my philosophical framework. But large language models can totally read all that. Um, Gemini 1.5 is up to a million and a half tokens. That's a lot. I can fit transcripts of all those journals in and they can fit it all together and try and make it more concise. Like, as you hear me doing this, I'll be very surprised if anybody, anybody but Theo and probably not even Theo will get through to this, where are we at? The 48 minute mark. But something I find with LLMs is I ask them, hey, do, do all these thoughts connect? Is there, am I, Am I prattling on about incoherent ideas and I'm, am I not substantiating them with analogy or direct evidence or what, what have you that supports how I'm using the thought form in my model? I want to know that. I, wanna, I want to make sure that I'm not leaving anything out or I'm losing any of the rich context. So, um, I mean, I'm f almost an hour in and I'm only at number, I will get through the first 10. And if you feel it's valuable for me to go through more and you do by some miracle get through all this and you find it to be bullshit, um, that's okay. If I feel inspired by something you come back with that I think would add value somehow to my work or sharing wisdom, I will do so. Um, I'll try and get through your first 10 at least. Uh, number six, I have never observed a phenomenon in which the existence of a God was a, ne a necessary antecedent for the known or probable explanation of the causation of that phenomenon. 
oh, I wish we would all just speak more plainly. All right, let me interpret those words. I've never, so he's never seen something that required God to explain the most likely reason for that thing to happen. Now, what I just did there is something I feel like, <laughs> God, I wish we could all just talk normally. Like, I feel like we're making everything into legalese unnecessarily. Um, I have never observed, I've never seen something that required God to explain its existence, I think is a <clears throat> safe way to, br to make six understandable to my eight-year-old kid. Um, I don't want to be repetitive here. I'm trying to think of some, some new magic way to facilitate some of my, or elucidate some of my earlier points in a fun new way for you. Here's a fun one, inspiration. Um, what art do you like, Theo? Are you, do you like music? Do you like, uh, I like classic rock. I like uh, Beatles and Hendrix. Um, Steppenwolf, Spencer Davis. I'm old for my age, I suppose, musically. <laughs> um, where does inspiration come from? And be really honest with yourself about it. Like, where does creativity come from in an above average creative human? Where did the Mona Lisa come from? Where did uh, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man come from? So you could say they, they were the cause and the Mona Lisa and Sergeant Pepper were the effect. Um, Did is that a natural expression of of chaos that beauty emerges with specifically let's look at the Vitruvian man and understand it as da Vinci where you understand all of the geometry involved and the poetic compression of mathematics and geometry that's expressed there where does that come from just being able to connect the dots on it. Um, I probably, what I would argue is God starts to look like a, a layer of the substrate where all of humanity is sort of connected and subconscious mind of collective consciousness is a thing and real. And again, I never really go to any of what I was taught to perceive the divine anymore. I look at all of the math and the f physics, the geometry and the art, and that's where it starts to, and the computer science. 
<laughs> that's where it starts to coalesce into the divine for me. Um, and then it just becomes an interpretation of, of sort of a glass half empty, glass half full. And I would say the, my old perspective was decidedly glass half empty. And it's shifted now after I see more and more evidence of turtles up and down the stack divine in a quantum potential that is the expression of all of this. I mean, that's how I see it. But you, my dude, are free to look at it however you want. And I don't want to win in an argument with you. If anything, I hope I've sparked some curiosity on some cool shit you can go study that might um, enrich your life, give you a new way to look at things. Maybe it'll even help you make your, your cases here <laughs> um, with more rigor. And uh, if that makes you happy, that makes me happy. I really just love the idea of everybody doing what they find fulfilling. This, this I find deeply fulfilling. And um, thank you for responding. Um, I loved your perspectives. Um, I may come back to this if you found this helpful, um, but I feel like I've already said quite a bit and we're at an hour and I need to get to my family. So um, to anybody listening, I just think you're the fucking coolest. <laughs> and um, I'll be very curious to hear what, um, oh, you know, I might grab all this, paste it into Claude 3 Opus, along with the transcripts of this podcast. And um, I think that'll be certainly worth exploring further. And um, so, yeah, I will come back to this. But for now, take care, everybody. Happy Sunday. Cheers. Now it's coming around. You're feeling good. Down and in the ground. And so we all come together. We making a sound. We sing. Look at all this love we found. Come on.